ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار We begin by praising Allah. We thank Him for making us Muslims, that being the most valuable gift to us. We ask Allah to guide us, to make us firm on the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah to grant us the correct understanding of Islam and to fill our hearts with the light of faith, Iman. Those whom Allah guides, nobody can mislead them and those whom He leads to stray, nobody can guide them. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and I also testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final messenger to the whole of mankind. And today we are going to bring a start rather perhaps three or a four part discussion on how Islam was established at the hands of people who had certain special characteristics and how after this amazing, almost unique as it were beginning we are also going to experience inshallah as an ummah, as a nation a unique ending so for want of better words on how to title this topic people have suggested perhaps we should talk it like, or we should label it like a unique or strange beginning and a wonderful end it's cryptic but that's what the subject matter is about that we need to know how Islam is very precious to us not only because it is Allah's word that is good enough and more than enough but it's very special because the way it was started and the way it's going to end and how that impacts on our own lives and very very briefly Islam started very weak extremely weak one person, two people three people dispossessed nothing in their hands no wealth to speak of rejected, abandoned, oppressed and the strange end or the wonderful end at least on earth we can say is how it spread and how Islam became triumphant over a lot of the earth's land mass and how there are promises that Islam would establish across the entire earth sometimes that seems far-fetched and we feel it's like a distant remote promise it may or may not come true if it comes true we need to look forward to it it's like so remote from our minds now how can it possibly be? so we tend to forget that the very first time when revelation came starting with the first prophet on earth that was a unique, an astounding event and many of us don't sit back and reflect on that phenomena that Allah Almighty from above the seven heavens, from above his throne he communicated to someone, a human being on earth now it's like the mind can't grasp the, the strangeness and the marvelousness of this phenomena you know, Allah's angels who carry His throne are huge, we talked about it before the dimensions given, you know, makes a, makes a mind boggle it's like, wow the distance between the earlobe and the neck for one of the angels who carry the throne of Allah is like if a bird was to fly at full speed, non-stop, for 40 years it would have hardly reached cover the distance and his feet are, as it were, resting on the earth and his head is above the seven heavens so how big is that? so it's huge one of those angels, there are eight rows of them carrying the throne 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, above the arsh, above that throne, spoke. And he spoke to a hardy dot on the face of the universe. You know, the earth, let alone a human being on it. Possible a speck. See, every time revelation came, it was a unique moment. And what is important for us to remember is that unique, or those kind of unique moments will never ever come to earth again. So when the final revelation happened, and the angel Gabriel, peace be on him, stopped coming with the speech of Allah to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something momentous had stopped happening forever and ever. So imagine living at that time when Allah is speaking to mankind and the Prophet is gracing the earth. It is a very amazing situation. So when the Messenger passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu they said, let's go and visit Ummu Ayman. And I've mentioned this hadith before in some context, remember. Let's go and visit Ummu Ayman radiallahu anha. She was a lady, as you must uh, might know, who had held Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was a baby. So one of the first ladies to hold baby Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she was very fond of Islam, very fond of him, and very obedient to Allah, and she single-handedly on her own did the Hijrah from Mecca to Medina all by herself in those days, in, in, in that time, you can imagine. It was very unsafe to venture out in the desert, in the desert for even men to go out. They had to go in groups, so there were bandits and so forth. And she walked all on her own, on, her, on foot, did the Hijrah. And the messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to you know, get up and greet her and rub her shoulders and say, How are you, my mother? She was that special to him. Because the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to respect her and love her as, as if she is like her, his mother, Abu Bakr Rama said, Adilan, let's go and visit that lady. She's a noble lady and to visit Muslims is a good thing to do. And he used to visit, so let's go and visit and see if she's okay or not. Incidentally, she was also one of those, we might not know, companions who was, as it were, given the good news of paradise on earth. We are not the ten, the ten who were given the good news, but others were given the, that good news as well. And her name is not often mentioned. And the, the messenger once said to the companions around them saying, who would like to marry a woman of paradise? You can't get a better recommendation than that, in that form. Not just would like to marry a good woman, but a lady of paradise. And what we should take note, is just a side point, is that all the companions more or less kept quiet. Nobody said, oh I would. Even after that type of recommendation, and that the side point is that shows that we have a choice in choosing our marriage partners. So even if somebody is very pious or very devoted or, and, and so on, you might still want not to marry that person for whatever reason. If you don't like his or her looks, for example. You don't look down upon her, but you don't prefer her as your husband or wife's spouse. Anyway, and she married Zaid radiallahu anhu, and of course uh, the very first baby that was born after Hijra to the Muslim community was Zaid's son, and uh, that was uh, Usama radiallahu anhu, Usama ibn Zaid. Anyway, so Abu Bakr and Omar went to visit her, alhamdulillah, and as soon as they went to her, she began to cry, and she began to weep. And so after some time, uh, Omar said to her, radiallahu anhu, you know, what makes you cry? Why are you so sad? Don't you know that which, that which is with Allah is better for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So try to comfort her, you know, saying if you miss him, then know that he's in a far better place. He's comfortable. He's well looked after. He's in paradise. He can't be in a better place and well looked after than being in paradise. So I know we all miss him, but why are you so sad? Be happy for him. And so Umm Ayman radiallahu anha, this lady, she said, I'm not crying because I don't know that which is with Allah is better for him than what is on earth. But I'm crying because revelation has now ceased. And this shows to us, it underlines and highlights the importance of us realizing just what had gone missing when the revelation stopped. But in a certain sense, we still have that revelation with us. And we really have to have that kind of a pure, you know, kind of innocent outlook that that precious occasion is still preserved or maintained 
in the unadulterated Quran and the authenticated Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah it was the revelation. And although that physical process does not take place anymore, we are the inheritors of that unique moment in history. History of the earth. And we have it in our homes. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah, we can find out, we can follow, we have the ability. And so how uncaring we have become when we don't take interest to find out and follow. Well, it's all preserved and ready and waiting for us to just grab, pick up and run with it. We don't. We invent excuses. So here are people, so what happened then was Abu Bakr and Omar, Radil both of them were aged, the old companions. And one of the hadiths says they are going to be the two foremost leading aged companions of paradise, Abu Bakr and Omar. So they are people of deep faith. Only the best of people are going to be in the highest of paradise. So those who are at the forefront must be the greatest in Islamic qualities. Must be. So they must have been the bravest, the most dedicated to Allah, the most sincere and so forth. So they are mature. They had gravity, they had authority, they are not superficial. Or well, wouldn't let the emotions overtake them and they lose their head, and let their hearts lose, lose, lose their life. Yet both of those companions, along with the woman, started Christ. So you can imagine, these best of people, Umm Aiman radiallahu anha, and two grown up men, who are like warriors, and they are crying like babies. Today if we behave like that, we just know look at those men crying with the woman. And what made them cry? Because of this realization, revelation has ceased. <clears throat> so these people understood the uniqueness of that moment, and that's the revelation which changed the lives of people to such an extent, because they followed it, they took it up, that they were transformed into people who were blessed all the time. And we still have that strange or unique promise given to all of us. One of them, for example, from Abu Yahya Suhaid ibn Sinan, anhu, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the case of a believer or the situation of a Muslim is unique, it's amazing. It makes you wonder, how can that be? It's amazing. And that is good, that is, uh, that is the case only with the believer. It doesn't happen to anyone else on earth. So potentially you and I can be in that situation or condition by Allah's grace if we want to be in that situation. How is that? He said there is good for him in everything. And this is not so for anyone except for the believer. If he experiences something pleasant, something good, something nice, he is grateful to Allah. So he's given us, he's told us the method through which we can attain this grace. So whenever I feel or I hear of or I experience something good, I should be grateful to Allah. So part of my learning about being a good Muslim is how do I be, how am I supposed to be grateful to Allah? Is it just prayers and nothing else? Is it just to say Alhamdulillah for having a good news? Or is it a lot of those things and others besides? That is like learning Islam in a practical way. So, whenever he hears or experiences something pleasant, he is grateful, thankful to Allah. And that is good for him. Allah rewards him. Allah likes it. And if he comes across something harmful, whether an unpleasant news, bad news we're getting all the time nowadays, aren't we, about Islam and Muslims. And today I went to buy petrol and I felt embarrassed because there in the front, the newspaper saying Bin Laden, you know, with 20 backpacks of nukes or something like that. Day in, day out, they're always trying to keep the temperature up, people's phobia up against Islam and the Muslims. They're like engineering hatred for Islam. And you feel ashamed to walk out because they're looking at you and saying, oh, there you go. I do mentoring at a school, I must have told you before, at a, a sixth form school in Ipswich, to a non-Muslim kid. <coughs> like a guardian father figure kind of thing. Just to help him along in his studies and so forth. And I went there and there's a group of girls, you know, like sixth form girls. 16, 17 year old, four or five of them, started shouting at them, Bin Laden, Bin Laden. So it is filtering down to people. I was wearing a suit, you know, not like this, I was wearing a suit, I had everything. They came from work. Still I got shouted at, or mocked at, or laughed at with Bin Laden, because of fear. I wasn't wearing a turban, Bin Laden. 
So we have to be serious. It is filtering through, whether as a joke or as a mockery or as in a serious poisoning effect. Filtering through all the time. So we need to be, inshallah, if he hears something harmful, he is patient and that is good for him. Be patient, meaning, don't have to accept the cat calls and the mockeries, but we have to be patient, meaning, keep up the Islamic behavior. And be truthful, be just, be merciful, be kind and all that, and keep our duties to Allah uncompromisingly. If we can do this, inshallah, then we are part of the same group of people who is in that situation of being rewarded or helped all the time, in all circumstances. So Islam indeed began like this. Very few people, it was unique, it was something extremely rare, and the, the, the rarity of the occasion is taken up, makes us rare as well. Makes us very rare. So let's start with this hadith, and let's show you just how rare we are. The first characteristic I would like to talk about is that at that time, people kept their hope paramount. Even though the numbers were feeble, and the dignity was understood, they understood their dignity. So today we are being laughed at, and the people are being brainwashed, or they are like, you know, conditioning the masses against Islam and the Muslims, and we are large in numbers, but still never lose hope. Keep the hope high, because the companions did, and the Prophet Wasallam kept up their hopes by telling them about certain things. And this is a hadith, one of them, for Ibn Mas'ud, he said about 40 of us were gathered in a hut. We were sitting together in this kubba. Kubba is like a domed construct. Could be a tent or a hut. But 40 of us. And you can imagine at that time, 40 of them, this is very early on in Islam, when people are suffering and so on. There are only very few people in Islam. So that, that's what, that was about the entire Muslim community. 40 of us sitting there with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what did he say? There we were, hounded out of society, with hardly any kind of end in sight of the oppression. And he says, would you like to be a quarter of the people of paradise? And I can imagine what that does to the heart, for, heart of a person. You know, are we going to survive their thinking perhaps, you know? Will we pull through this oppression? He's saying, would you like to be a quarter of all the people ever to be in paradise, starting from Adam till the end of time. That many? There is 40 of us here. Half of millions of people will go to paradise, starting from Adam alayhi salam. So, that is hope. That means, after us, there will be other Muslims as well, and other Muslims besides, and many of them will go to paradise. So this message will pass through, will pass the test. I said, yes indeed. So would you be happy to be a third of the people of paradise? I said, yes. He said, by Allah in whose hands is my life, the one who controls my life. I hope that he will be half the people of paradise. So he's hope, he's giving hope. You know, the man put in charge of passing on the truth from Allah is telling them when the world is caving in around them and the world looks very dark, that don't worry, no matter what happens, whether you die or live, in the end, you and your people and, and the, your future generation descendants will kill half the people of paradise. I hope for that. And we should know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never disappoint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He does not disappoint any believer from what is good for them. And the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the purest. And we know that not because we like to say it, what else should we say about him? No. We know that by studying his lifestyle, knowing how he treated his people and how he worshipped Allah. His heart was the purest. The proof is there from his actions. Yes, we can't see into his heart, but we know from his actions. If an insincere person cannot have behaved the way he behaved consistently for as long as he was a prophet and even before that. So Allah will not disappoint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he said, this is because, half the people of paradise, this is because nobody will enter paradise except he is a Muslim. And your ratio against the disbelievers is like that of a white hair on the skin of a black bull or a black hair on the skin of a red ox. Okay. It's rare. 
It was a very rare occasion and we are very rare people and numbers are not important. What is important is that we the Muslims, however many or few we are, we are loyal to Allah, we are sincere, and we try our very best. And a handful of us can then defeat and overcome you know, insurmountable as it were obstacles. We can. So this is how rare we are, we are precious. So if you know there are Muslims around you and they are not quite up to scratch, don't be disheartened and don't look down upon them, don't repel them, don't condemn them, you know, don't punish them. Because we are already under punishment from the godless people. And we have our problems, we have to sort it and tackle it. Not condemn and push and repel and reduce even what few people we have with some goodness in their hearts. Another way to understand hope is this hadith, the messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah is more happy with the repentance of his servant when he turns back to him, than if one of you were to be like this person. He loses his camel in the barren desert. And this was mentioned, barren desert, not just any old desert. Because some deserts have scrubs, you know. Some deserts have, you know, frequently uh, oases and so on. No, totally barren, desolate place. And his camel is the only thing that he has with his food and drink, means of survival. And he loses it. So what's going to happen? He's going to become frantic and look for it and, you know, run up and down and look at the horizon. Where is it? Because not finding the camel means a certain death. There's no point even trying to walk in one direction and say, maybe I'll find... You just can't. Few miles, few hours, you'll be desiccated, you know, you, you would pass to death. So having lost all hope of finding it, he just lies down under the shade of a tree in despair. And he just says, I'll just, I'll just lie down and die. Becoming more hopeless than that. I'll just lie down, no, no, even, no, 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 no point even, you know, lighting a fire, smoke signal, nothing. I'll just lie down and die. Just lie here and die. What's the point of walking out, walking around? So he does that. He lies down and he's just waiting to just die in agony. And then he looks up and suddenly he sees the camel just standing right next to him. With all his food and drink and everything. He didn't even put in any, any effort whatsoever to find the camel. But the camel is just standing there. So in extreme happiness, of course he's not overexcited. In extreme happiness he blurts out saying, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana, wa, wa ana rabbuka. Allahumma anta abdi, oh Allah, you are my slave. But Anna and I am your Lord, Rabbuka. Entirely the opposite thing. And the hadith is not new, I know you have had it before. So look at the injustice he has done. He has said something which under normal circumstances would take a person outside of Islam automatically. Even as a joke. If now as a joke you say, you know, just for making people laugh. Without intending evil, we say this. Like that. You'll become a kafir without a doubt. You'll be a mutad. You can repent and come back into the deen, but until you do, you're a kafir. Without a doubt. To say you are the Lord of Allah. Yeah. We are told in Surah uh, uh, Tawbah, chapter 9, ayah 65, anybody who makes a fun of Allah or his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa a single ayah of the Quran, even as a joke, is a disbeliever. So we Muslims never make fun of Islam even just a past time. It is a very serious offense. So what happens here? Allah doesn't mind. Allah overlooks it. Because Allah knows he's, he's got carried away. He's just so happy at the way Allah helped him out. Out of thankfulness to Allah, he was going to thank Allah and just slipped off of his mouth. The wrong way around. This is how merciful Allah is and how much Allah likes when a person repents. So look at the hope in here. No matter how bad we have become, no matter how evil we are, how ignorant we are and bad behaving, no. If we just stop those bad things and come back to Allah, He is more happy. And in fact, it's better for us to repent and stay kufr than not to repent. It's amazing. Rather you give up your bad ways and become a Muslim and find your way sorted out by Allah and then out of a mistake you do some kufur act, something like a kafir would do. It's not a problem. Don't worry about it. Allah is so happy with you, He overlooks it. So this is the first point. At that time hope was paramount 
numbers for people. And the end of rel the relief was, there's no, no end in sight for that, for that. The second point, the second the unique thing is, part of this hope was that they were given the assurance of victory. And this is something we don't talk about anymore nowadays. There are many hadiths in, Isla in, in Islamic literature, authentic tradition, which talk about how victory is assured, success and victory is guaranteed for Islam and the Muslims, stage by stage. After suffering and trials and being overcome in battle and many things, but the ultimate war is won by the Muslims. And it's not warmongering, it's not trying to be pugilistic, you know, and trying to be ill. No, nothing. But it's about retaining conviction, maintaining our faith. If I, am, if I don't have confidence that I belong to the winning team, I'll feel deflated, you know, like, what's the point, you know? I'll do it because I have to, I suppose, but I know I'm going to lose in the, in the end. Imagine thinking like that for anything, going for a driving test or a job interview or exam, you know? I'm going to say it anyway, maybe I'll pass and well, I must just go along and take the test. You don't want to make it. And we all know that normally we have to always aim high and perhaps we reach a grade below that or a grade below that. We never aim low. So that was a time when victory was assured for the people when wondering how they will pull through. So that's the second point. Concentrate on the promises of Allah of how He will bring relief not only for our personal problems and difficulties but relief in terms of the ascendancy of Islam, establishment of the deen or his law, and how the enemies will be overcome, and justice will prevail across the entire earth, and of course the great victory of us being in paradise, and looking down at the people in hellfire who had mocked us personally, one to one, and telling them, well where are you? We found our promise from Allah true, have you found your promise true? And they will respond, and they will beg you. They will beg you from hellfire saying, please give us one drop of drink. Just one drop. The very people who laughed at us, laughed at us, will be surrounded by the fire and saying, we are now surrounded by the very things we used to laugh at. They will be full of regret. So you know, we have victory assured. And this hadith we know from Khabbab ibn al-Arab radiallahu He said, we complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of the increasing persecution in, in, in Makkah and he was sitting at the Kaaba he's resting, relaxing he made a pillow out of his sheet and he's relaxing at the Kaaba and we came, he came and said why don't you seek Allah's help for us? it's like today and incidentally by the way brothers and sisters you know if you are convinced that what I'm saying is wrong because you spoke to a knowledgeable person, alim, shaykh, imam, whoever, then don't follow it. From what I've understood from the people I've referred to and discussed and looked at the proof, you can pray in your sujood in English or Urdu or Gujarati, whatever you speak. Now you can in your sujood, at least in the prayers. If you feel like trouble doing it in front of prayers, I don't, but I feel troubled. But nafil prayers, like in Tarawi prayers or Sunnah prayers, you can, in your frustration, ask Allah for what you want. And we should be asking Allah to give us relief of what they are plotting and planning against the Muslimun or the common innocent people of any country. And one country is in the forefront of the news all the time. And you can see how childish it has become. And you wonder why bother? Why bother giving excuses and reasons and cook them up and, you know, mock our intelligence? You want to go and kill people? Go and kill people. Are you looking for approval? To kill people? Islam does not condemn killing, it does not condone killing people. Even killing animals unjustly. So it's not about, you know, because you're going to kill Muslims, no. If you're going to kill the worst of mankind on earth unjustly like that, we would not approve, because we are Muslims. Don't look for approval. You want to go and be a murderer, be a murderer, then we can't stop you. So what are you trying to do? Kidding around like this. To pray in your sujood. You to protect the Muslim moon. To forgive the Muslim moon. So Allah forgive the Muslims, He protect them. And it's not good enough for you and I just to shout and throw and throw at the mouth and say, look how many people they are killing to starvation. The most important thing we can do, the powerful thing we can do, is to ask Allah in prostration. 
I don't know how many Muslims missed the opportunity in Ramadan in Tarawih to pray for the Muslims in the Sajood because of set differences. So he came and he said, why don't you pray to Allah to bring relief to us? Why don't you supplicate? And Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from amongst those who have gone before you, a man would be caught and held in a pit dug for him in the earth. And you know this hadith as well. And he would then be sawed in two with a sore placed over his head. And his flesh would be combed away from his body with iron combs. And yet that would not make him give up on faith. And you have to realize that when these people, in the name of justice and freedom, and democratic values and so forth, come along and attack, they attack mercilessly. 700 to 800 babies died in that bomb shelter when they bombed and missiled it. Boys to death. And being burned by steam is much harder, much worse than being burned by fire. Their bodies melted while they were screaming. That's how they died. Babies, infants. And they talk about terrorism. Did they recant on faith? Did you hear of one person saying, I'm not going to be a Muslim now and save me? When they herded 3,000 odd people into a fort and shot them and killed them and bombed them, did any of them give up their faith? In Kalai Zamgi, in Afghanistan, when they packed them in articulated lorries and closed, sealed up all the exits, and they shot into the lorry to open up holes for breathing, and they're bleeding inside because they were getting shot, and they suffocated to death and let eat. Thousands of them. They could have been lined up and shot, would have been more humane, didn't. Did any of them give up faith? And when those souls were buried alive, 50, 60,000 of them were buried alive in the so-called Gulf War. Did you hear one of them saying, I'm a Catholic now, help me? They would not give up faith. So Allah will surely help Islam complete its mission till a rider will proceed from Sana'a to Hadramaut without fearing anyone except the wolf, natural problems, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِدْنَكُمْ تَسْتَعَجِلُونَ But you appear to be in too much of a haste. You appear to be in a bit of a hurry there. So be patient. Victory is assured. And numbers were feeble. So there was a time there was only two of them worshipping Allah on the entire face of the earth. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wife was older than him by 20 years. Then he was a small boy. Talking to Ali radiallahu anhu. And he was even an older man. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So the time there was only about seven of them worshipping the earth. On the earth. It was uh, Ammar anhu, and his mother Sumayya anha. Bilal anhu, Suhaib al-Rumi anhu. This is his seven people. And all of them were tortured. Except that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was protected by Abu Talib, his uncle. And Abu Bakr was supported by his tribe. The rest of them, all of them, without exception, were tortured, beaten up put up in the desert heat, with stones on their chest. And this is we learn when we are little kids, stories. And we forget, they are just as relevant today to us grown up. Because those things happen, and don't forget it. Bilal was, rather than taken in the midday sun and put in the desert, so a chest to you know, heavy weight on his chest, to snuff the life out of him. And he was put in an iron armor, and his body would be seared, and go inert with the heat, being you know, cooked like that. And keep on saying there is only one Allah to be worshipped. Sumayya radiallahu anhu, the first martyr, the Shaheed. How was she killed, do you know? Does anybody know how she was killed? In this day we baronet people, in those days they put a spear to her private part. In her womb. That's how she was killed. She didn't give up faith. And Amma was tortured and she, he witnessed her mother being, his mother being killed like that. Only for saying la ilaha illallah. He was so badly tortured, he came back, and then the Prophet said, because he, came, he was let go, because he said with his mouth, I'm not a Muslim, or I don't believe in God, something like that. So the Messenger said to him, how did you feel 
when you said that? How was your heart? He said, my heart was firm. So he only said that to save himself from further agony. And well, next time if they do the same to you, if they do the same to you, say it again. You are permitted to say false things like that, objectionable things like that. Because I understand just how much torture you have to endure. So these companions that endure torture, we can't endure. And they still do similar things today to the Muslims. They've done similar things in Bosnia to the ladies. They threw babies up and they never made up stories and they just buried them, let the baby fall onto the knife. And watch it rise to death slowly. And if, if we forget this thing, we think it's emotionalism. This is behavior in this century, hardly ten years back, in a European country. And then the Quran says very clearly, now how shaitan incites them to madness, so they behave like worse than animals. This some type of cruelty was never known. The son would be asked to physically bite off the private part of his father, chew it off, and then they both be killed. You can't imagine the horrible ways that oppressed and, and, and humiliated the Muslims. So we are going to be tested, but victory is assured. And Allah says in the Quran, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُلُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do men think they will be left alone or saying, we believe and they will not be tested? So we are not looking to be tested. We don't want to be tested. In fact, we ask Allah not to test us. As hard as just tested the people before us. But we are going to be tested. So now, at this time, today, this date, in this area, what is our test? Well, you have to think, you have to ask. It could be the way I'm walking down the street, something will happen. Maybe somebody will pass a comment. Maybe somebody will try to pull my hijab off or, you know, call it in love or something. That is a test. Everything. When I go to the shop and the shopkeeper, the way he treats me, asks me about my pound of potatoes I'm going to buy, that's a test. But the point is we are alert. We have to be alert on our toes all the time. And not lose grasp from the Islamic behavior. We did test those before them, and Allah will surely know those who are true from those who are false. But, the, the victory is here, it said, It is he who has sent his messenger, who al ladhi asa raslahu bil huda wa deen al haq li yuzahu ala deen kulli wa la wa karihal mushrikun. It is he who has sent his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with guidance and the religion of truth to make it overcome it is proclaimed over all other religions or ideologies, even though the pagans may detest it. And pagans do detest it. You know, have you been listening to the news recently? Turkey has been snubbed and they are a bit upset. They want to belong to the EU club. And they want to be more Europeans than they want they are accepted as Europeans. Because a bit of Asia minor is in Europe, isn't it? You know, okay. So what did Jack Straw say when he was interviewed on uh, the, yesterday? So why this delay for two years or three years and then we'll consider properly, you know, whether he has made enough progress to join the EU. Okay. It's not politics. It's being knowledgeable, a little bit aware of his current affairs and on what basis they are judging us. France and Germany are the two countries opposing the worst. So no, you can't have them because they are Muslims. Openly they are saying so. We can't have that country as part of EU, we have Czechoslovakia maybe. In Czechoslovakia, brothers and sisters, there's a report on BBC4, last week I heard it, that on the roadside, these Czechoslo Czechoslovaks, Czech people, the German tourists primarily, they offer even a two-year-old babies as prostitutes. Two-year-old babies carrying in their arms, you know? Would you like to have some money? To have sex with your my, my own baby. That's the civilization. We might have Czechoslovakia as part of the EU, but not Turkey, because Turkish people are primarily Muslims. Now, let's not worry about, you know, most of the people in Turkey, the educated class, don't even pray and drink wine and eat pork. No, they're Muslims. These are called them those Muslims. Good enough. So Jack Straw said, it's not, the EU is not about uh, physical landmass or geography or boundaries like that. It's about values. Democratic values. It's a nice fancy way of saying ideology. 
It's like you know, lying with beautiful words. You know, when the, the statistics bureau in Britain got it wrong about something, they're on the news as well, they were saying, no, our, our, our figures were not wrong, we have released improved figures. You can say, you can say what do you like? We Muslims are more perceptive and keen. We know, we know what's going on. Islam is about values. Value regarding Allah, value regarding His creation and the people. And our values are the six articles of faith and what springs from it. And it's emanating from our tawheed. How we think, how we feel, what we do, our outlook, values. Otherwise the Quran is very clear in Al-Baqarah, Al- Ayah 177. It is not righteousness that you turn your faces to the east or the west. But righteousness is rather the six articles of faith are mentioned, the five pillars are mentioned, and some qualities of faith are mentioned. So it's not about, you know, I've grown my beard or I have to face Tibla and all these... No, those are rules and regulations. But they count for nothing when the values are lost. So he is lost. So as the scholars have said, the true worshipper, they know that all fruit take time to ripen. And the sweetness of the fruit of victory needs its own time to ripen according to the decree of Allah. And the salaf, the early generations used to say, whoever rushes a thing before its time, he will spoil it. And I think the ladies might appreciate this better than men, but at home, just for information, I do the cooking. So I appreciate it as well. I like cooking. If you rush up your curry or whatever you're making, you're going to spoil the cooking. We know it. Don't try and rush victory. We can't hasten victory and bring on relief from Allah. We can't hurry up Allah. Can't do that. So therefore, patiently persevere. فَاصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ وَلَا تَسْتَعَجِلْ لَهُمْ Therefore, patiently persevere. Cling on to it with your dear life. And carry on with tenacity. You cling on to it like you're biting onto it with your molar teeth. So you place your face and you won't let go. You just wouldn't let go. Persevere patiently as did all the messengers of insectable purpose. All the prophets were like that. They did not budge or squirm. They don't move an inch. Whether you throw them in the fire or you promise them the sun and the moon and be the most beautiful girl in the community or be the richest man on earth, didn't budge. And be no haste about the disbelievers. What happened? In the battle of Khandak, this was a battle when the messenger وسلم, personally did a labor, a laboring labor job, like a common workman, and they're digging the trench. The only means of defense against an overwhelming large army is to dig in. So during that harsh climate, in that harsh terrain, you know, it was very hard to use your knives and your spades and forks and pitchforks, what have you, to dig this trench to be in there. They didn't have excavators and stuff like that. And they're digging this trench around Medina. And they come across this big rock and they can't shift it. And the companions are on the rest strong, somewhere weak physically speaking, in terms of masculineness and so on. But nobody could shift it. They all tried. Nobody could, you know, crack that rock. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I will go down and do it myself. So he touched his clothes. Yeah. to the spade, and he got down. A common man with a spade in his hand. But this was somebody looking at it, who wouldn't know who is who. This like a common man went in there, and he said, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, and he struck the rock, and one third of that boulder chipped away his spell. You know, it's a miracle, and it's something that happened because Allah supported him and made it happen. Because he wasn't exactly the most, you know, like the strongest he-man or anything like that, no. He was strong, but not the strongest in the entire community, in, in terms of muscle strength. And one said, scripture, what did he say? He said, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. I have been given the keys of Syria, and I do see her red force from this place of mine. Amazing. We are trying to dig in and wondering if we are going to again survive against this attack. There's so many of them, so few of us, we have nothing. And he's telling us, not this battle, but time is coming, that we're going to conquer Syria. And those forts are open to us, and I can see them from here. Are you having us on? But this hope, this is an assurance of victory. It's a bismillah. 
had the rock again, another third chipped away. So two thirds gone. So Allahu Akbar, I have been given the keys of Persia. I, in my time, will conquer Persia. And by Allah, I do see cities and his white force from this place of mine. He said, Bismillah and heard and hit the rock again, it's all gone. Reduced to rubble or dust. And he says, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. This is important to remember. It happens because Allah supports. He is the greatest. No one is going to overcome Allah. Allah is not a vengeful God, as is in the Christian parlance they say. Our God is not a vengeful God, no. Allah is not interested in revenge, or he's not trying to fight with no, he's nothing of the sort. He is the greatest. It is right to be worshipped. And he's going to make his deen prevail over the earth, and he's going to do justice. So Allah is the greatest. I have been given the keys of Yemen. So the entire Arabian Peninsula now. You've got Syria, Persia, and Yemen. Can you imagine a landmass now? He said, all of this will come under my sway. That's why he just say that I have been given my sustenance under the shade of my spear. And he who opposes me will be met with humiliation. And Bukhari. We don't mention these things anymore because it's, it's a bit sensitive not to mention things like this. But he did say this. My sustenance, my rizq, my provision, my welfare, my earnings, what I get to eat, what I get to wear, how my country runs, how people are carrying on in their jobs. My earning is under the shade of my spear. And the other hadith in Bukhari, and remember paradise is under the shade of the sword. So, so when this ayah came, his companion said, we knew what he mentioned. Ayah says, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ When they saw the confederates, all the people have gathered against them, arraigned in ranks to fight the Muslims, to finish them off once and all. But that's what Ahzab was about that. They said, enough is enough. If we don't stop Muhammad now, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can't handle it later. Now is the time. Let's all get together, team up, finish him off. And they all came various tribes together. So when the Muslims saw the enemy gather, Quran says, they said, they said, this is what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promised us. So we now see that people are gathering to attack Iraq and they talk about muting Makkah and Medina. You say, this is what Allah has promised, Allah's Rasul promised us. Don't be disheartened. Don't say, what's going to happen? Supposing they do, well let them. Let's do what we have to do. Get on with what we need to get on with. And don't worry about it. But don't let anyone dishearten you and confuse you and make you feel despondent and hopeless and, you know, deflated. Don't. Then they have won the battle. But if you're brave and you're still fully convinced and they haven't shaken your faith at all, no matter whatever is happening, let us do what is right, whatever the outcome. When we die, we die with dignity and with assurance of the hereafter. And Allah and His Messenger told us what was true. And it only added to their faith. وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا It only added to their faith and the zeal for obedience. So now we have the last ten minutes left. We finish with that. We have covered about, I think, three characteristics today. The first one was, we said, that that was a time when hope was paramount, although they were feeble in number. And today we are very large in number. We've got to make hope of priority importance. Secondly, that was a time when victory, the news of victory was given and they understood and accepted it without questioning. And when they saw the bad things happening around them, they said, this is what Allah promised. We just have to overcome it and face it. The third one is, because of this, they could stand up and show chivalry unparalleled in the entire history of mankind. And that's something again we have to uh, explore in detail, either in privately or in group amongst you. Read books and find out the companions about how brave they were. You know, they pale into insignificance. The stories of the, the grand knight in shining armor in Britain in the medieval times. These knights would go to rescue a damsel in distress, at the same time they'd go and kill and rape other women. Nothing. They don't, don't compare at all. These knights that supposed to go out and rescue and do acts of chivalry in terms of charity. And then they'll be lording it in their own castles in our way, feasting on themselves and their neighbors dying hungry. 
have been consistent contradictions in their lives. These are the nights of our, our Western countries. Companions, you look at them. They didn't wear shining armor, but look at their lives. To be amazed. One story. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. So my uncle Anas ibn Nadar radiallahu anhu was not present at the Battle of Badr. We finish with this today, inshallah. The, the time, the first characteristic that was the time, people stood up and stood up bravely. They showed the greatest feast of courage. So my uh, uncle Anas ibn Nadar radiallahu anhu was not present in the Battle of Badr. So he said to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if I could join you in your first battle, I would have done so. If I had the chance to fight the pagans though next time, Allah will show, Allah will enable me to show you how I perform. He's living with this regret and his ambition. Why well, I missed the first opportunity with the exit of Islam after that. I missed it. But if another time comes, I'll prove it to you. And you'll see how I, I can dedicate myself to this struggle. So these are his companions sitting there and waiting, regretting the past for having missed the time and looking forward to another chance when they could prove themselves to Allah. So on the day of the Battle of Uhud, the Muslims apparently suffered a defeat. And in the story about how the archers left the post and something went wrong and so on. That's what it means. Apparently, apparently suffered a defeat. So he said, Allah, I plead with you. Now I beg you and I pray unto you concerning that which the Muslims have done. We excuse them. I'm not part of that. They failed in their duty and responsibility, but I'm not part of that. Don't count me amongst the blameworthy, but forgive them. So I plead with you for what the Muslims have done, and I disassociate myself from what the pagans are doing. And this should be the attitude for ourselves. If we find Muslims are messing things up in terms of da'wah or whatever it may be, okay, we are upset, we try to not to repeat the same mistake, we try to advise, but ask Allah nevertheless to forgive them. But we disassociate ourselves with the ways of the pagans. So yes, if there are people coming along and unwisely and incorrectly saying that perhaps we can even do acts of violence in Britain, they are wrong and we wonder why they are spoiling it for everyone, Islam, Muslims and all. So we ask Allah to forgive them and disapprove. But they are, on the other hand, never going to get us on board on this false war, which they call the just war, against innocent people for economic reasons. Well, even if against the Jews even, we will not support it. Or any other, North Korea, if they attack North Korea, we will not support it. Just like people of conscience never supported the Vietnam War. So uh, he made his prayer, then he went forward, and he met Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, another companion, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. I said, O oh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, for the Lord of the Kaaba, swearing by Allah, so it is true. It's not heat of the moment, it's something he experienced, and he's swearing by Allah. So by the Lord of the Kaaba, I smell the fragrance of paradise coming from the side of Uhud. The miracle Allah granted him, how they're fired up. And so, and, and Sa'ad then said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I don't have the power to describe what he did. And his companions do not exaggerate, they're not telling tales, you know. They're all truthful. And they measure their words. Because if anyone is going to act on the hadith, he will believe in Allah on the last day, let him speak good, or not speak at all, it will be them. The men of few words, the women of few words. So when Sa'ad and Muad is saying, I can't describe what he did, it's an indication of trying to imagine for us what he must have done, how he could, who must have been standing there and, and, and against everyone you know, in spite of pain and still fighting and blood pouring out of his body. Because he said, his, his nephew is saying, Anas bin Malik, we found on his body more than 80 wounds and injuries from knives and swords and arrows and so forth. You, know? you see them in Hollywood films sometimes, isn't it? Man living one arm and one leg and shot to bits and he's still carrying a flag and you know, just acting. Never happened in real life for them. It happened to us in real life. Eighty wounds. And then after he fell in the battle, they cut off his nose and ears and it mutilated him. And only his sister found out that that is, you know, my brother on the tip of his finger. He's so badly mutilated. He was really cut up into bits and he's still fighting to the last breath. Those people meant it when they say we fight to the last drop of our blood. 
And the ayah was revealed, and the companion said, we thought that this ayah was revealed, this ayah came down from Allah, referring to him and those like him, not just him, and those like him. Said, amongst the believers are men who have been true to their covenant they made with Allah. They are true to the path, the agreement they made with Allah. Some have fulfilled their vow, and some laid down, and, and laid down their lives in battle, and there are others, some, who wait. They are waiting. They have not weakened in the resolve in the least. They have not weakened in the resolve in the least, in determination. So New Year is coming, we have to make a New Year's resolution, I suppose, to follow the culture of this country. We are British, Alhamdulillah. Why not? Make a resolution. I'm not going to wait for the new year, but if I need to, you know, whatever, I feel a bit lazy, at least, starting from this so-called new year, January the 1st, I'm going to be a better Muslim ever. I'm going to really get down to studying and finding out, not becoming academic and impractical, irresponsible and head in the clouds. I want to be somebody who is knowledgeable and stable, and carry on from there. Make it an ambition. One year, two years, you'll find the amount of knowledge you pick up, and how it changes is going to be amazing, thrilling, inshallah. With any experience. Anyway, may Allah guide me and guide you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us upon the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us in our, assist us in our efforts to learn the Islam and practice it. Practice it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather all the Muslims in the best of paradise of Jannah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. 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 Subhanahu wa ta'ala.